My name is Roy Young, and I'm the president and CEO of James Madison's Montpelier, a presidential home, a site of former enslavement, and the birthplace of the U.S. Constitution located in Orange, Virginia. I'd like to welcome you to the opening evening of the Five Freedoms series, brought to you by Montpelier, the Center for Civic Education, and the First Amendment Museum, truly a coast-to-coast -coast partnership. During the debates over the ratification of the Constitution, it became clear that many Americans were frightened by what they were about to create. The Constitution would breathe life into an entirely new national government, which many feared had enormous powers. Even some who argued in favor of ratification were, certain, were concerned that this new national government might be too powerful and that it might violate the rights of individuals, the very problems that Americans tried to overcome by fighting the Revolutionary War against Great Britain. The First Amendment protects those rights that many people consider the most important, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, and the freedom to petition and assemble. This is what makes the free flow of news, political dialogue, and self-expression possible in a free society. We look forward to hearing from scholars and practitioners as we consider these freedoms in historical context and in modern day situations. Now I'm gonna hand off to Mia from the Center for Civic Education. Thank you, Roy. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mia Nagowicki, and I am the Vice President and Chief of Staff at the Center for Civic Education. Uh, so on behalf of Christopher Riano, the Center's President, and the entire Center for Civic Education team, I am delighted to welcome everyone here to this evening's webinar, kicking off the Five Freedoms series. So just a brief introduction, the Center for Civic Education, we are a national civic education organization founded in 1965. And our programs, including our flagship, We the People, the Citizen, and the Constitution, have a presence in all 50 states and in nations around the world. Our programs explore constitutional history, principles, and institutions, and provide learners with practical knowledge and skills they need to be responsible members of their communities. Through these learning experiences, we come to understand and appreciate that our system of government is not static, but rather constitutional democracy was designed to accommodate an ever-changing world, and we all have a role to play in shaping our present and our future. A big thank you to the teams at James Madison's Montpelier and the First Amendment Museum uh, working together to put together this wonderful program this evening. Thanks to all of you for being with us tonight. Uh, and with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Christian Kotz. Hi, everyone. Are you seeing, Emily, are they seeing my uh... Beautiful picture of our, our house in Maine here. Yes. You're all good, Christian. It's wonderful. Thanks. Great. Hi, <laughs> everyone. I'm Christian Coates. I'm the CEO of the First Amendment Museum in Augusta, Maine. I want to first thank Montpelier and the Center for Civic Education for inviting us to partner with them in this upcoming series of talks. The First Amendment Museum is a relatively new nonpartisan nonprofit museum that's dedicated to helping people understand and inspiring them to exercise their First Amendment freedoms. But unlike your high school history class or most other civics oriented museums you'll visit, we're not interested in presenting visitors with a timeline of Supreme Court cases or a blow by blow of First Amendment history. Instead, we want to inspire people to live their freedoms, to experience the five freedoms in their own lives. And that doesn't mean we're building a boot camp for aspiring activists, nor are we an ivory tower for academics. We want to help regular people realize how they're using their First Amendment freedoms every day without even knowing it, to understand those freedoms, where they came from and how they work, and, into, and to inspire them to exercise their freedoms intentionally and effectively. We're located in the Capitol Historic District of Augusta here in Maine. Our next door neighbor is the governor's mansion and two doors down is the state house. It's a perfect setting for a museum about the first amendment. The amendment that does the most to influence and make change in our government and in our society. 
Madison said that the end of government is justice. Dr. King said that the moral arc of the universe bends toward justice. And a good friend of mine, an award-winning civil rights professor likes to say, if that arc bends towards justice, it's only because a whole lot of people have been pulling on it. We want to inspire people to live their freedoms because it's only by living our freedoms, by understanding and exercising our First Amendment rights, by pulling on that arc, that we can create that more perfect union that is our American charge to build. Thanks for joining us tonight. Welcome to Roosevelt. Mia, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks very much, Christian. I loved your slides. Very impressive. <laughs> uh, before I introduce our topic and, uh, and our speaker, just a few housekeeping notes. I'm delighted to serve as this evening's moderator. Um, we will begin shortly with a talk from our guest speaker, Roosevelt Montas. Very exciting. Um, we will reserve a fair amount of time at the end for Q&A. The best way to submit your question uh, and have it be answered is to do so in the chat. However, we have set the chat to private so that while Roosevelt is speaking, we can all focus on his insights and his ideas and not be distracted by running commentary in the chat. So the chat has been set to private. I encourage you, if, if and as you have comments or questions, please add them to the chat, but make sure you are sending them to me, to Mia Nagawicki, as I am the person who will be moderating that Q&A uh, when we get to that portion of the evening. So there's a little blue drop down arrow uh, next to the to field in the chat. If you just click on my name in there, then your questions will come to me and I will relay them to Roosevelt. Um, we will have a good amount of time for Q&A, hopefully about 30 minutes, so don't be shy, put your ideas, put your questions in there. Uh, we will end promptly at 8.30 Eastern time to send you all on your merry way, uh, and we'll preview next week's webinar topic at that time. So with that, let's dive in. Uh, as you all know, tonight's topic is freedom of speech, which is perhaps the right that most readily comes to Americans' minds uh, when we think about the First Amendment. We hold this right very dear, but its scope and its limits have been debated since the Bill of Rights was ratified. And as we watch our society evolve today, we have a front row seat for how this freedom fundamentally shapes the American experience, from campaigns for office to the arts, from social media to education and well beyond. So with all of that in mind, I am truly delighted to be joined this evening by my good friend, Roosevelt Montas, who is Senior Lecturer in American Studies at Columbia University, um, where he was also Director of the Center for the Core Curriculum at Columbia College for a decade. Roosevelt specializes in American citizenship as understood through the lens of antebellum literature and culture. And he brings this humanistic approach to work with undergraduates, as well as first generation pre-college students in Columbia's Freedom and Citizenship Project. Dr. Montas, who, who earned his bachelor's, his master's, and his PhD uh, in English and comparative literature from Columbia University, has brought all of his great scholarship and experience working with young people to bear in writing his forthcoming book, which is entitled Rescuing Socrates, How the Great Books Changed My Life and Why They Matter for a New Generation, which will be released in just a few weeks time. I have had the true pleasure of working closely with Roosevelt over the past few years, and I leave every encounter with him more excited and more enlightened uh, than I was at the start. So I'm so grateful to you for joining us this evening, Roosevelt. Thank you, welcome, and please take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mia, for that really generous introduction. Um, really delighted to be here. Um, uh, thank you, Emily, for reaching out to me. Thank you, Christopher Riano, for um, the many years of friendship. And so nice to find you now at the Center for Civic Education. And um, thanks to everyone at the Jim Jim Madison's Montpellier. Um, what a great series that you have put together here, thinking about the First Amendment. And um, it's really an honor for me to to begin. Really an honor for me to to be the first speaker in the series. Um, I want to begin with a kind of a disclaimer. That is, I, and I'll do that by way of telling you a little bit about myself and what I hope to do with my 45 or, or, or 
45 to 60 minutes that I want to talk and then uh, what I hope to get from, from the discussions. Um, I teach American intellectual history at Columbia. Um, intellectual history is essentially the history of ideas. Um, what does that mean? Well, ideas, categories, norms, intellectual frameworks through which we understand and interact with the world, they have a history. They did not arise spontaneously fully formed, but evolved over time, usually as the result of debate and struggle. Uh, one of the great pleasures of teaching undergraduates, I, I often teach a, a history of political thought, Western political thought, is to track the evolution, the change, the transformation of uh, ideas that we take for granted and think that are kind of always eternal existing, but, but they're not. Um, ideas don't arise spontaneously fully formed. Um, now, because I study American intellectual history, a lot of what I do is American political thought, which includes, in, in, in my approach, literature. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about literature and looking at the ways in which literature um, both reflects, but also moves forward this evolution of ideas. So my disclaimer is that I'm not speaking to you as an expert on free speech. Um, much of the history of the application of free speech has happened in, in the courts. It's uh, much of the, of the history has been a legal history. I'm not a legal historian. I am someone with a serious interest in American political ideas and American political thought. And today I bring that set of interests to bear on the idea of free speech. Um, there may be some of you in the audience that, that know the history of uh, litigation and case histories that have created the legal framework for our contemporary practice of free speech better than I do. And I hope that you share that as part of the, the um, interactive portion of, of the evening. I guess one more thing I wanna say um, uh, that, that informs the way that I approach this topic and indeed informs the way that I approach the history of American political thought. Um, I'm an immigrant. I came to the United States when I was 12 years old from the Dominican Republic. Um, and I think you can, you can hear some of that in my accent. Um, my, my tongue still resists uh, some English phonemes. So I ask for your forbearance over that. Uh, but that, that uh, experience of immigration and uh, outsider status has instilled a kind of attentiveness to American ways, to the fact of this country that really has informed the way that I, that I have uh, come to understand my own, my own place in, in the American national project. I became a US citizen in 2000 uh, by choice, right? A deliberate decision. There's no other country that I would rather be a citizen of. And part of that is, um, the political entity that is America. That is America. Uh, part of that choice has to do with the appeal um, of those ideas in themselves. Um, but also another part of that is that America is the kind of place, perhaps the only such place in the world where someone like me could come and actually become American. You usually can't get to go to another place and become a national. I mean, in some cases you might be able to legally gain citizenship, but you can't go to France and become French, just like you can't go to Argentina and become Argentinian, and you can't go to the Dominican Republic and become Dominican. Um, but this is a place where you, where you can do that. When I travel abroad, I, don't, you know, I say I'm, I'm American and nobody wonders, how can an American have been born in the Dominican Republic? Um, so it's from all those perspectives that I want to put some thoughts before you about the First Amendment, and in particular, about the freedom of speech that is affirmed in that. Um, so this is the first in a series um, on the five freedoms, five freedoms guaranteed by that First Amendment. I have a, a, a few slides that I want to show you today, primarily um, to make my presentation less monotonous, um, to, to uh, give a little visual diversity to what I'm doing. Most of what I'm going to put up are quotes 
um, or summaries, textual summaries of things that I am saying. So you need not be distracted by them, but um, you can also take a look. For example, take a look at this, which is the text of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably, peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Um, one thing that you will note immediately here is the uh, religion is the first thing that comes up. And um, with a, a firm prohibition on the federal government to um, establish a religion. So, you know, sometimes people say that America is a Christian country. In some obvious way, it is. It's the product of a Judeo Christian religious ethical heritage, um, which I think some might argue is a decisive influence in our political heritage. Um, but even though we, there is a legitimacy to that claim, um, this country is explicitly and uh, pointedly established on a non-sectarian, non-religious basis. And, and, and that's why the first uh, utterance of that First Amendment to the Constitution concerns the non-establishment by the government of, um, of religion. Uh, if you are familiar with, with Jefferson's, Jefferson's history, Jefferson's uh, epitaph in, in, in his tomb, which he wrote himself, there are three accomplishments that he, that he points to. One is the, uh, uh, his, his, his uh, writing of the Declaration of Independence, his founding of the University of Virginia, and his fight for the disestablishment of religion in Virginia. This is a, a, a really central uh, thrust in the, early, in the early formation and conception of, um, of, of America as a national project. So five freedoms, they are these. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof. Congress will make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Congress will make no law abridging the freedom of the press. Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people to peaceably assemble. Congress shall make no law abridging the right of people to petition the government for redress of grievances. I've rewritten those and listed them with the stem of the amendment in each of the five freedoms. So that stem is important. I'm gonna come back to it in, in a minute. Congress will make no law touching these, uh, these five freedoms. And you, know, you see those five freedoms and you immediately feel that there's a lot to say and a lot to think about, about each of them. And each of them gives us a, an entry point and a reflection into the intellectual universe of the founders and into the political, social, historical debates and tensions that, that literally shaped our, 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 our political genesis. Um, we today begin this series, I think correctly. I remember when I, I met with me and, and, and Emily and, and asked them, why, why are we starting with speech? rather than with religion, which is the first of the five freedoms in the, in the First Amendment. I think that is uh, the, right, the right choice because um, uh, freedom of speech um, is in some way the fundamental freedom. And freedom of religion is in some sense only a specific application of the right to freedom of speech or, 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 or better understood the right to free expression. Um, in fact, all of the freedoms boil down to the freedom of expression, which is most directly indicated by our, by our primary means of expression, which is speech. So we should understand, as the courts have understood, that word speech in the First Amendment to mean expression. That is, that word speech to stand for not only utterances that we make vocally, that we articulate and voice vocally, but expression through sign language, 
expression through writing, expression through symbols, expression through visual uh, visual means, etc. It's a it's a it's an expansive an expansive right. Um, the first ten amendments you probably all know are collectively known as the Bill of Rights, and they were ratified in 1791. Um, the Constitutional Convention is, is just such a fascinating moment in American history. It takes place in Philadelphia uh, over, a, over, over a whole summer. Uh, it's very hot sometimes. These 55 men are locked in a room. Um, the debates sometimes are, are fierce. Uh, the compromises are laborious. Um, it's a real, real heavy endeavor and, several, and, and at several points it, it is on the verge of collapsing. It is on the verge of disintegrating um, and, and reverting, which would have reverted the national government back to the Articles of Confederation, which the original, the original intent of the Constitutional Convention was to revise the Articles of Confederation. Uh, but there's a handful of prime movers, uh, Madison, chief among them, along with Hamilton and, um, and Adams, um, but they arrive at Philadelphia with a plan in their pocket um, to in fact convert this assembly to revise the Articles of Confederation into, the, into architecting an entire new government to jettison from day one the Articles of Confederation and begin anew. Um, and in that, if, you're, if you read strictly, they violate the mandate that they came in there with. Um, their mandate and the authorization they had was to revise the Articles of Confederation. Not only do they come up with an entirely new uh, form of government with 12 colonies represented, Rhode Island boycotted the whole thing. Um, and the New York delegation, which was made up of three delegates, two of them left early on in the convention. So there was never a quorum from New York. Uh, only Hamilton stayed behind leading George Washington once to quip that the, that the final Constitution was signed by 11 states plus Colonel Hamilton. Um, the, they come in with a so-called the Virginia plan, which um, essentially lays out the in broad outline what the constitution came to be. Um, at the very end of the convention, um, when everybody's tired and they've been away from home, and they finally have a document that everyone has agreed to and that is kind of ready to be forwarded to the, to the Congress. Somebody gets up and says, hey, uh, the big thing missing here is a bill of rights. We need an enumeration of rights. And that idea is not new. Um, that, that, that's not a, a novel idea. We have various antecedents, including the Magna Carta, the um, English Declaration of Rights of 1688, probably most importantly, the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Um, so we, there is a precedent for this, but, but people get up in the convention and, and say, no, um, not because it's September already, but um, because many felt that an enumeration of the rights actually would suggest that rights not enumerated could be uh, violated. And Hamilton was, was chief in making this argument. But as the delegates get back to their states and each state um, begins their constitutional conventions where they will vote to ratify or reject the constitution, the anti-federalist sentiment, the, 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 the wing of opposition to the constitution um, was, was fierce on, in its demand for a bill of rights. Um, so that in many states, ultimately the constitution is ratified on the condition that the first order of business of the new government is going to be to get together and propose a bill of rights. And uh, that's exactly what happens, um, rights. The idea of rights is absolutely central to the American government. Um, the whole project of creating a national entity is premised on the notion of rights. It's a national compact about rights, um, but not rights in the sense in which most Europeans were familiar with them, but rights in an entirely new construction. Rights as things that were universally shared by every person by virtue 
simply of being human. Um, the, Ameri the, the Declaration of Independence is perhaps the clearest articulation of this idea. Um, you are you are probably all familiar with with this quote. Um, by which I mean this quote. We hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Um, gosh, whenever I read that, it's just an ex it's the extraordinary eloquence and the extraordinary elegance of uh, the articulation of those high ideals really, uh, really stands out. Um, it makes you grateful that uh, Benjamin Franklin and John Adams who were tasked with the subcommittee along with Jefferson uh, and two others to, to write the Declaration of Independence. Franklin and Adams immediately said, we're not writing it. Jefferson, you should write it. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good call, but that's it. Um, in, it, it. In those opening sentences of the, of the Declaration of Independence, there is a whole theory of human nature. And there is a whole theory of government. Ultimately, there is a theory there of the nature of human existence. Um, in those in those sentences, um, and the ideas are revolutionary. And let me let me just highlight some of the of the things about this framing, right? The framing, the soil out of which the First Amendment is going to grow, the soil out of which is going to give the substance, and which the First Amendment will and, and the entire Bill of Rights will give a a a, a precise articulation. Um, first thing here is that all men are created equal. That idea is radical and revolutionary. Um, I, I, I alluded before to how much I enjoy teaching undergraduates and, and tracing the evolution of political concepts. This idea of human equality um, is a very recent idea in human history. Um, it's not there in the ancient texts, even, even revered ancient, ancient texts um, in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the biblical texts. Uh, it's not there. There's no, no notion that everybody's created equal. There is in Christianity already an impulse towards universalization in that uh, Christianity breaks out of Judaism and makes salvation available to everyone in principle, but with the proviso that even though it's available to everybody in principle, most people are not going to be, uh, to be safe. Um, the idea of a society premised on the notion that everyone is the same just does not exist in antiquity. You read Plato, you read Aristotle, you read Thucydides, you read Hobbes. And Hobbes actually is the first place where, it, where the idea emerges. Uh, but you read Machiavelli, you read Aquinas, you read St. Augustine, uh, you read Cicero. Um, no one takes the idea seriously. No one even entertains the idea that humans are equal uh, and that a society is going to be organized on the premise of the equality of all of its, of, of its members. Even places that had democracy like ancient Athens, right? Ancient Athens is a democracy in which among a segment of the population, there is formal legal, legal equality, male citizens, right? There's no equality for women, there's no equality for foreigners, and there's certainly no equality for slaves, which made up a majority of the population. Um, just that idea that people are equal and that on that equality, you can form a national a national entity is radical and revolutionary. Another revolutionary idea there is that governments are established to secure rights. And, and notice the centrality of rights, um, that that is the point of government. And what rights, right? Another kind of stroke, stroke of extraordinary elegance and, 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 and poetry by Jefferson, um, rights that are inherent and inalienable and which include the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
there is an important variation in that formula from the from the the, the source philosopher for the Declaration of Independence is largely John Locke. And John Locke has this formula. He says it over and over again. And many of the state con constitutions of the, in the colonies had this formula, life, liberty, and property. But, but, but Jefferson changes it here to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and that governments are instituted to secure those rights for everybody. I, I think it's hard for us to put ourselves in, 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 the, in the political moment of the, of the mid 18th century and feel just how, how dreamy, what a dream, what a, what a kind of fantasy that is. Um, last point I wanna make about it, this being a, a radical articulation is the notion that rights are anterior to government. Right? Governments are instituted to secure those rights. Those rights are not given by governments. They're not established by governments. They're not the grants of government. They are existing there already. And government comes in to secure them. And of course, the people have the right to overthrow the government if the government fails to secure that, those rights. So this gets back to that, to the, to that stem in the First Amendment. Government shall make no law. Um, Congress shall make no law. Right? The government is barred from infringing on rights that are, are already there. Let me say the obvious that this is, that this is in some fundamental way a religious idea. Um, and um, you, can, you can understand John Locke, the most important thinker on natural rights as a fundamentally religious thinker. And even today, um, people who do not have a religious um, orientation towards these concepts. These concepts tend to act like what, what I call God concepts, kind of ultimate transcendent um, self-evident truths, a kind of metaphysical epistemological bedrock. Um, those commitments to rights as being in some sense transcendent and embedded in the very notion of, of human nature, in the very constitution of human nature. Now, this is a fundamentally different conception of rights than the one operative in European society where a right meant an entitlement or a privilege without any sense of equality. In fact, rights were the thing that made you unequal. Um, there were some kind of exclusive privilege or grant. Um, so, you know, you, if you were a noble, you had certain rights um, with respect to taxation, with respect to your um, command over, over and, and right to have, say, a military, a military force, a uh, right to tax um, people who lived in your lands, a right to um, use certain roads. Um, if you were a king, you had a, a different set of rights, a different set of privileges. Sometimes if you were, you, you would be granted these privileges, you would be granted a right as the colonists who came to um, uh, the Northeast coast of the, of, of the British colonies to establish a colony. They were given a right, they were given a license, a charter to start a, um, a, set, a, a settlement in, lines, in, in lands that were um, under the control of the king. This is the European idea of rights. Um, the American idea of rights here is an entirely different uh, conception of what what a what a right is. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about about the freedom of speech. Speech. First thing to say is uh, what a strange idea free speech. The idea of free speech is um, the fact is that speech is never really free. Um, there are significant constraints and there are a lot of gray, gray areas. Um, when we think of kind of with a pure notion of free speech, there's no such thing. Um, now, some of the most important conversations in our, we have in our society, um, often in the courts, concern the gray areas, concern exactly the carve-outs, concern exactly 
the constraints that are going to be imposed on free speech. And I, and I hope to put some of um, those gray areas and, 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 and boundary conditions in front of us tonight um, before the end of my talk. Um, next on the strangeness of, of, of the idea of freedom of speech, um, you know, I, I, have, I have a child, I have a three and a half year old boy um, who is very verbally advanced and very, very verbally precocious. Um, and I certainly don't encourage freedom of speech um, in the child. I, in fact, uh, don't conduct myself with freedom of speech in front of him. Or in fact, I don't conduct myself with freedom of speech in this forum or, or, or almost, almost ever. Um, we operate, society operates, civility operates, relationships operate under a series of self-imposed constraints to freedom of speech. Otherwise, we could not function, we could not relate. So um, that's a really prominent strangeness, a really problem, prominent weirdness about freedom of speech that is an idea that we protect, um, but a practice we avoid. Freedom of speech is an idea that we protect, but a practice we avoid. It's a principle that we cherish and enshrine in our highest laws, um, but which we do not practice and cannot practice. Um, there is a kind of, uh, a kind of paradox. Um, as, I've, as, as I've said, or as I've suggested, it's also a novel idea. Um, it's also like the idea of rights not there in antiquity. Um, the notion of freedom of speech, it just doesn't occur to anyone. The great political thinkers of antiquity, the Middle Ages, and even up to the Renaissance, Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, and Augustine, Cicero, Machiavelli, just doesn't occur to anybody to uh, talk about freedom of speech, to, to dwell on the idea of freedom of speech. Um, the idea just doesn't exist in antiquity. And, and it's because it's a, it's a really unintuitive idea. It's a kind of made up idea. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ideal and it just doesn't, doesn't exist in antiquity. Um, so other ways in which, in which free speech is not really free. Um, the first amendment not, notice restricts government only, not private entities, including businesses and corporations. Um, so today, <clears throat> private governments and private entities can in fact enforce quite severe um, constraints of speech. Um, you know, we have a case which we may again uh, come to where the major social media platforms, um, the two dominant social media platforms, namely Facebook and Twitter, uh, the platform barred, the former president of the United States from using them. Um, a clear infringement of um, Donald Trump's ability to exercise free speech, a, a clear constraint on that. Um, yet, um, it's on sound legal basis because these are corporations and businesses which have uh, the rules, the protections of the First Amendment do not apply in the same way. They do apply. There are certain forms of discrimination, obviously, that are not that are specifically barred, um, including in, in, including with respect to speech. Um, but there are different rules. These protections that are so beautifully articulated in that First Amendment um, are not absolute protections, but protections about what Congress can do, and what about what government can do. Um, now, but even when you take the government. Even Congress isn't absolutely barred from infringing on some categories of speech. Among the categories of speech that are not protected are obscenity, child pornography, uh, speech that incites to illegal actions, false advertising, um, and there are others. There, there is a, a whole category, there are whole categories of speech that actually do not fall under the First Amendment protection. And, you know, one, one, Topic of discussion that whether we get to discuss or not, I would offer to you as a thing to think about is, is the justification for these restrictions on free speech. Are they really justified? 
uh, will, would we be better off if um, there was absolute freedom of speech? If we pushed for um, the even the most obnoxious and undesirable forms of expression. If we said, no, we are going to hold absolute this uh, right of freedom of speech. Um, think about think about that and, and, and think about the legitimacy of any constraint on freedom of speech. Are we, is this a God-given natural inher inherent right or is it not? And if it is, um, on what basis can we legitimately circumscribe it? Um, now, these questions are usually decided in court, but court rulings always work in the framework of public sentiment and general mores. The lines inside of which the courts operate are drawn by in the broader cultural context of ideas. The way we think about and apply freedom of speech in modern life um, is the result of such contests um, and such decisions. One can pick out some of the most prominent moments in that social evolution. Um, when it comes to, to free speech, there's probably no text that's more influential in the modern application of, of uh, free speech than, than John, Stewart's, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. Um, Mill, which is a, who is a British philosopher, man of letters, uh, one time parliamentarian, um, was concerned with a set of questions that were raised by Alexis de Tocqueville in his monumental two volume book called Democracy in America. You'll remember that de Tocqueville came to the United States in, in the late 1820s. Uh, he spent um, something, I think something between one and two years um, something in the close to a year in the United States, traveling around um, on a on a mission from the French government to study the the prison prison systems in America. Alexis de Tocqueville was in fact studying something else. He was studying democracy, um, and he says, you know, democracy at the beginning of democracy in America is overtaking all of the world. He says every force in history seems to be providentially guided towards the establishment of democracy. America is at the uh, cutting edge of democracy. So I am going to take my time in America to examine the practice of democracy and write what becomes a foundational political theory text about the nature of democracy and, and, and a sociological text about the nature of American democracy. Well, in Democracy in America, the Tocqueville raises a series of questions, a series of concerns that can be summarized in the phrase that also serves as the title for one of his most famous chapters, the tyranny of the majority, tyranny of the majority. So here's a quote from the Tocqueville about this issue of tyranny of the majority. When therefore I see the right and capacity to enact everything given to any authority whatsoever, whether it be called people or king, democracy or aristocracy, whether exercised as in, in, in a monarchy or in a republic, I say the seed of tyranny lies there and I seek to live under different rules, under different laws. Um, the Tocqueville's concern is that in, in a democratic society as he, is, as he sees in America, there are no checks or constraints in the majority. If a majority, decides to oppress a minority, as indeed a majority of white America democratically chooses to do to the minority black population, enslave them, deprive them of their rights, exploit them. Tocqueville sees that in a democracy where the majority holds ultimate power for everything, you have a tyranny of the majority. There are no protections to rights. There are no protections to these inherent God, God given, according to some, um, rights that, human, that humans have. There is a way in which democracy and the idea of natural rights are intention. These are the questions that concern Mill. And Mill is the great theorist of what we have we come to call liberal democracy, right? Liberal democracy is a form of democracy that delineates certain areas on which democratic 
the democratic will may not prevail. There are constraints to the power and to, the, and to, and to democratic action. A, a liberal democracy is a democracy that puts brakes on the force of democratic will. Uh, the, the democratic majorities cannot deprive minorities of their rights. Um, democratic majorities may not um, uh, violate um, the law, um, may not make laws that apply to some but not to others, um, et cetera. Liberal democracy, a constrained democracy, a tamed democracy, a, a, a democracy that puts uh, a kind of brittle, a bridle on the uh, impulses of the majority. Um, Mill's answer to the problems that the Tocqueville raises is this theorization of um, liberal democracy. And in particular, this question that I would again ask you to think about. What power does the collective have to infringe on the freedom of the individual? Which is uh, uh, the larger question about what power we have to curb free speech, to constrain free speech. That is a, a specific application of this general democratic theoretical question. What, under what conditions, what power does the collective have over the, the freedom of the individual? Mill answers this question with what he calls the harm principle. So here is a longish quote and bear with me um, from On Liberty, the 1859 major treatise on um, both free speech but also personal liberty in general. Here's what Mill says. The object of this essay is to assert one very simple principle as entitled to govern absolutely the dealings of society with the individuals in a way of in, in the way of compulsion and control, whether the means used be physical force in the form of legal penalties or the moral coercion of public opinion. That principle is that the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection that the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not sufficient warrant. Powerful stuff there, the harm principle. The basic idea is that the only justification for the collective to infringe on the rights of an individual is when the exercise of the rights by the individual will harm others. Um, and he adds the important qualification, not harm themselves. We cannot make laws that, harm, that, that constrict people's ability to harm themselves. That is not a, a, a valid justification. The only justification to constrain the liberty of someone by the collective is harm to others. This is the harm principle. And Mill uses the harm principle to formulate the rule by which, by which free speech may be limited. Um, and here's a famous articulation of that rule. On the contrary, even opinions lose their immunity when the circumstances in which they are expressed are such as to constitute their, exp their expression a positive instigation to some mischievous act. An opinion that corn dealers are starvers of the poor or that private property is robbery ought to be unmolested when simply articulated through the press, but may justly incur punishment when delivered orally to an excited mob assembled before the house of a corn dealer or when handed about among the same mob in the form of placards. Um, this is just a you know, famous example. You can, you can denounce corn dealers as thieves and robbers starvers of the poor in a nice editorial or newspaper article in a pamphlet. But if you make those accusations in, 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 to an angry mob outside the house of a corn dealer, and that angry mob then proceeds to assault the corn dealer, you are liable, you're responsible. Those words are not protected. 
they are incitement to violence. So this is this is Mill's extension of the harm principle to the to situations in which it can it can it can apply to to speech. Speech is constrained by the harm principle. Obviously, you know, uh, question that we have been wrestling with as a society and which Congress wrestled with in the Senate trial, the second impeachment of Donald Trump was whether Donald Trump standing in front of a crowd of supporters on January 6th and saying, we have to march over to the Capitol and um, you know put some spine behind Republicans and forget about Democrats, and we have to take back our government. And uh, then that mob marching to the Capitol and assaulting guards and occupying um, and desecrating the, the Capitol, whether those words fall under this criterion of um, incitement to violence. Um, you know, that's a question that we have, that we have wrestled, we have wrestled with. And again, um, it has not been dealt with in court, obviously, but in a, in a kind of special court over, over impeachment. Um, and you'll remember that a majority of senators did feel that, that the line had been crossed. Um, now, cases are, are really straightforward like that, or like this, this corn dealer, um, it's hard to pinpoint um, when fervent speech bleeds over into incitement to action, right? So that's a very hard line to tease out when it is that a, a fervent exercise of the freedom of speech and opinion um, bleeds over into incitement to, to action. Um, so let me kind of begin to wrap up um, my my presentation by putting before you a couple of areas that are kind of alive in our contemporary conversation, our contemporary thinking, our contemporary shaping of what this notion of free speech speech is. Uh, we have seen that as an ideal, as a pure ideal, is unworkable. It's, it's never been implemented in America or anywhere else. Never even attempted to be implemented in its pure form in America or or everywhere else. We shape what this means. We um, give the substance to exactly what it is that we mean by free speech. And um, so here are some areas that we are today grappling with, contending with um, about what free speech means. One is this question of psychological harm. Um, what do we do about speech that um, that harms a, a, a vulnerable individual? Um, we and and you know in Mill, it's very clearly physical. Like in, in Mill's criterion is if you say something that incites someone to to do physical violence, that's constrained. Um, emotional violence, insults, offense, none of that is uh, curtailable in Mill's standard. That's not the standard we apply uh, in the United States. We have a much, a, a much more restrictive standard than, than the, the standard Mill laid out in 1859 in, on liberty. Um, but today we, we, we come against, against these questions. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a professor, so I, I live in academia. Um, and this is a question that often comes up. Um, uh, you know, a certain speaker coming to campus that a certain population feels uh, threatened by. Uh, you know, imagine a white supremacist coming to speak and Jewish students um, are, are uh, alarmed, are feel threatened, feel insecure, feel unsafe, uh, feel unwelcome in a community that also welcomes these people who hold these views. Sometimes um, people of color have um, objections to certain questions being debated or to certain speakers coming in. Uh, those are examples on campus. Um, but we have lots of examples in just broader society about this question of psychological harm. How far can we, should we um, prohibit or curtail speech that is that causes psychological harm? Um, you know, we have, we, we for example, um, have very strict um, rules about what minors can be exposed to, right? We understand that there are certain forms of speech, certain articulations, certain expressions that would be psychologically harmful 
to children. So we have, we're, we're clear about that and we have very, very strict, severe constraints on that. Um, well, you know, how, where do we stop those protections? Um, why at 18 or 16 or 21? And also why, uh, where do we stop? Where do we draw the line about things that could be harmful, not only to children, but to say uh, other kinds of vulnerable members in society? And I'm, you know, I place this because it's a real question. And I think we often, when we think about this question, just tend, just tend to assume a reflexively, reflexively ideological extreme position. I'm, I'm, I'm all for freedom. Or no, I'm up, I'm, I, I am against uh, certain forms of um, offensive or, or harm, harmful speech. But the fact is that it, these are gray areas. And it calls upon us to make particular value judgments and particular value judgments that how do we then generalize those value judgments in a way that can be applied across the board in society? Not easy questions. And I think anybody who thinks they have the answer um, and they have the rule by which every case can be solved, um, I think is deluding themselves. Uh, they're, they're complicated issues. Um, so another area that we, concern now about in our contemporary debates, contemporary culture is, is uh, conspiracy theories, which have grown extraordinarily potent and widespread in with the rise of social media. You know, um, many of you are in the DC area, so you'll remember Pizzagate, uh, which is the first time that this came into, that, that this issue came to, into my attention. I mean, other people are paying attention, but you'll remember that, and, and, and probably it's, I don't remember the details. Uh, I didn't look them up and write them down. It just just occurred to me, but many of you will know the details. But essentially, um, a a conspiracy was circulated that many people believe that there was a child sex trafficking ring um, in the D.C. area that involved many high-profile politicians, mm -hmm. demo, high-ranking Democrats. And one of whose um, hubs or, or locales was this pizza shop. Pizza shop, um, and um, the conspiracy spilled out of the internet to where somebody showed up with heavily armed to um, go and disrupt this sex trafficking operation in the pizza shop. Um, well, you know, it was it was it was for many of us. It was it, it was a glimpse that there was something going on facilitated by social media having to do with, with conspiracy theories that was uh, both more dangerous but more pervasive and compelling than we could have imagined. Um, you know, there is the issue of Holocaust denial, which many countries have explicit laws against. You cannot minimize or question the, um, the fact of the uh, European holo Holocaust and genocide of Jews in the World War II. Um, we have issues today about, say, misinformation about, about COVID, COVID vaccines. What, what can we do, should we do, or do we have the right to do um, to constrain speech that says, um, spreads the idea that COVID vaccines are harmful, that they are, you know, um, a government program to install chips on people or steal their genetic information or implant a virus that can be used later for control, et cetera. Um, do we as a society have a right to curb um, such things? And if so, by what mechanisms and by what means? Who decides, right? Um, another uh, current issue is, is the um, idea of the election of stolen, that the 2020 presidential election was um, uh, a fraud, that Donald Trump won it and Joe Biden lost it. Um, what should we do about those claims? Um, we know, as I mentioned earlier, that Twitter and Facebook um, first began to tag uh, posts that made those claims as disputed 
um, and eventually began to remove people from the platform who consistently advanced um, that narrative. Um, another issue that we're thinking about is cancel cu culture and self censorship. Now, cancel cul culture is a term that I have never heard anybody use except people as, as a criticism. Nobody, I've never heard anybody speak up for cancel culture. Cancel culture is only um, used to point to the danger, the flaws, the um, uh, injustice of it. Um, but there is certainly, uh, the, well, one thing I want to say about cancel culture is that it's not new. Um, it's not a phenomenon of the of social media. It's not a phenomenon of the left. It's not a phenomenon of campus politics. Cancel culture has been a dominant feature of American political life. And like everything else, uh, fuel has been poured on those hot on those flames by uh, by social media and other forms of instant communication. And uh, and lack of civic education in our in our in our population. But let me give you let me give you a quote. I'll come back to this slide. But let me show you this slide, which which gets it's it's our old friend uh, Alexis de Tocqueville um, from Democracy in America. I know of no country. This is this is 1835. I know of no country where there is generally less independence of thought and real freedom of debate than in America. This is at the same time that America is the most democratic country. It is also the country where there is less independence of thought and real freedom of debate. In America, says the Tocqueville, the majority has staked out a formidable fence around thought. Inside those limits, a writer is free, but woe betide him if he dares to stray beyond them. He is the victim of all kinds of unpleasantness and everyday persecutions. A political career is close to him. Is close to him. Literary genius does not thrive without freedom of thought, and there is no freedom of thought in America, says Alexis de Tocqueville. Cancel culture of the of, of, of the nineteenth century, um, but it's it's one of the issues that we are that we are facing with not that we're that, that we're faced with this impulse, um, and uh, the consequences that it has to what the Tocqueville describes as as uh, terms that we recognize as self censorship. That is the kind of inhibition. Uh, this is again teaching undergraduates. I um I see this all the time. Undergraduates are so um, concerned not to take a position, and this is again not only today, but it's I think especially fierce today. Not to take a position or not to utter an opinion, make a judgment um, in a classroom discussion that would alienate them from a student body consensus. Uh, they're terrified. To do that, in, and 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 professors are terrified to do that, and of course that's not just on campus. There's a kind of concentration of that uh, of those uh, uh, currents in on campuses, but in many other institutions and in the general, in the general, um, you know, in the general uh, culture, in the media, in politics, um, you name it. I speaking back to undergraduate. The, Kind of world in which I live, I, I take very seriously the notion that part of my job in the classroom is to create an atmosphere in which a popular, an unpopular opinion is safe. That is, I am one of my jobs as a classroom instructor is to be the protector of minority opinion, um, and I, my task is to create an atmosphere where those opinions can be voiced um, and can be examined and can be. Uh, listened to and interrogated uh, respectfully, um, rationally. Last, last two things quickly, uh, hate speech. Um, that is speech that is used deliberately to cause offense and to degrade someone, often on the basis of their race, religion, or, or sexual orientation. Um, you know, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia are, are common examples of this racist speech. Um, we do curb hate speech um, in ways that we, don't, that, that we don't curb other speeches, other forms of speech. How far, where do we draw the line between the kinds of speech that will be tolerated, especially 
when uh, vulnerable populations are being um, rhetorically, through the act of speech, um, degraded or threatened or uh, diminished in some in some way. Um, the last example is um, the Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission decision of 2009, um, Supreme Court case in which Citizens United um, made a film um, during the prime the the 20, 2008 presidential primary uh, contest. Uh, while in the, on the Democratic side, Barack Obama was duking it out with Hillary Clinton for the nomination for president, uh, this film came out by Citizens United uh, against Hillary Clinton, a film that um, raised questions about her suitability for government, her integrity, her uh, et cetera. Um, and this, this film came out during the primary season. Um, it was, uh, it violated, it seemed to violate existing campaign campaign laws restricting the expenditure of corporate bodies in uh, political campaigns close to the election. The Supreme Court uh, overturned those election restrictions and declared them unconstitutional and introduced several really important um, uh, under legal understandings about the relationship between corporations, money, and free speech. Um, you can read the very eloquent um, uh, opin majority opinions and the very eloquent dissents. Um, it was a 5-4 decision, um, but the majority essentially um, equated money and speech. That is the right of free, of free speech includes the right to spend money in advance of your beliefs. Uh, money as a form, money expenditure or messaging as a form of expression. And the extended, the right that individuals may have to do that to corporate individuals. If an individual can do it, if an individual is, um, has the right to spend his or her money to advance the messaging, the political messaging that they back, then groups of individual, that individual coming together with other like-minded individuals also have the same, uh, the same right, uh, it, it creating the landscape um, of our current political messaging um, where of course vast amounts of money um, determine the debate, the political messaging, um, speech equaling money in political expenditures and corporations equaling individual in the same. Um, okay, um, well, there's a lot there and I hope that it's um, enough to generate interesting discussion. And um, I realize that it is not kind of live discussion, but um, moderated through questions and comments, but um, from the position that I've taken pains to emphasize of non-expert, I am happy uh, to opine on anything pretty much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Roosevelt. I will never get used to not being able to hear applause on Zoom. So <laughs> amplify this by a lot. <laughs> Wonderfully complex and insightful talk. I so appreciate it. Uh, we've got a lot of thoughts, comments, questions that um, we can dive into in these next 20 minutes. Let's see how, where shall we start? Uh, okay, so there's there's kind of a theme here that I think uh, we should start with and to start digging into it. It's it's sort of this question uh, that I think is fundamental to the question of speech and that we're really seeing play out in real time today in a way that maybe we haven't um, in recent history and in, in recent memory, which is this question of freedom of speech and civility and how how we manage those how we balance those particularly in the age of social media mm -hmm. so um to get us started in exploring this uh sharon posed the question this way which is uh people hide behind words on social media platforms that hurt others uh, and they do this in their chats and in their responses so as a society how should we, how can we ensure that free speech is honored 
while also restricted enough to stop others from hurt speech, which right. I think is, right. you know, you've sort of started to talk about that, but. Right, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a central dilemma. And I think one is at pains to find the, the principle that is going to guide one's judgment on these questions. Um, uh, one is at pains to find such a principle because the lines are constantly shifting. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, Mia, you, you might have heard me at some point read this passage. One of, my, one of my favorite passages in American literature is a passage from Frederick Douglass where he tells the story of learning to read. And the, the way it goes is that he, he was born in a plantation as a slave and as a boy, he is uh, sent to live in the house of his, his owner's brother in Baltimore um, to be the companion to another little boy um, in the household, the son of the master of the house. Um, and when Douglas gets there, his uh, mistress, that is his, the wife of his, of his um, not his legal owner, but it's his legal owner is back in the plantation. But the, the person in charge of him, his master, as he calls him, um, his mistress, the, the wife of the mother of the, of the companion, begins to teach him to read, um, teach him the letters of the alphabet. And Douglas is beginning to be able to make out words of three or four letters when Mr. All, the master, finds out um, and prohibits the, the Mistress Sophia was her name, Sophia Old, to, to continue to teach. And then Douglas quotes the words that his master spoke. Um, and even today, even the word master today, one says with a little trepidation, uh, because it harkens back to a legal arrangement that we recognize as morally reprehensible and which we don't accept as legitimate. Uh, but language is full of landmines, right? It's what, what the best one can do is use it consciously. Uh, but but in, in, his, in, in his master's rant, he uses the N-word repeatedly. Um, and, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I used to read that passage um, where Douglas puts a racial slur, which was a racial slur when Douglas wrote it. It's not like it, the word changed its meaning. It had the meaning it has today in the, in the words of an enslaver um, attacking him and denigrating him. Um, so I would just read it and I would read what Douglas wrote. Uh, which was that his slave master in the circumstances used this very offensive slur. Um, um, I am a person of color, so I always felt even, even less concerned about it being taken the wrong way. Um, well, nowadays I continue to read that passage, but I, I don't pronounce the word. Um, and, I, and I give a little speech every time I, I, I read the passage because that word has come to um, signify something different in the last 10 or 15 years. It has a different phalanx. And, and that's not something I control. And that's not something that anybody controls. Isn't that, isn't that something that, that I can just insist not be the case? Um, you know, if you studied language and linguistics, you realize that meaning is socially constructed. There's no private meanings. You don't control the way that meanings change. Um, and um, the current valence of that word makes it offensive and unacceptable to many people. Um, there are many people who, now you can, we, we can debate, and I do debate whether the grounds upon which uh, the, wor the word when used um, in, in, in a context where you're being, the words being named, the words being referred to, whether it's not, uh, you know, whether it's rational or makes sense to take off offense at that. And we're gonna have those debates. But we um, live in that environment today. And um, I, in deference to people who may find that word offensive, may find that word unacceptable, may feel strongly, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't need to sacrifice this personal choice, right? I don't need to sacrifice what I have to say on the altar that those people should not be offended by that because it doesn't make sense that they'd be offended by that word. Um, no, I, you know, it, it costs me nothing to respect um, that. And in fact, it provides the basis in which, we, from which we can have dialogue. But that's a decision that I make personally, right? And, and, and I think there are people who have a hard time um, with that and, and just and, and refuse, refuse to do it. And then, of course, you have to live with the con social consequences right. of that. 
Um, right. And that, that, so that's an example to say that where the line is drawn and how it is drawn um, is very difficult to um, sketch out in precise principle. It's a shifting line. And we always have to be negotiating our own attitudes and our own um, practices around mm -hmm. that shifting, those shifting norms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's not an answer. That's well, just a reflection. <laughs> but it's particularly interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, one is just that you are, you're in classrooms with undergraduates all the time. And those people in, in your classroom, those undergraduates, you know, it's sort of a cliche, but they are, they are the future. They are the direction in which our country is moving. So it's very valuable to have a sense for what those conversations look like and, and what you're navigating in terms of these questions every day. And I think that's actually an interesting transition to another great question that we got, this one from Eric, uh, about a question around who, is, is there any way to say who has the ultimate responsibility to sort of police freedom of speech? You know, is it is it the Supreme Court? Is it my neighbor? Is it myself? Is it all of the above? Is it none of the above? Is it evolving in this very yeah. moment? Yeah, Th that is such a good, I think it's such a good instance of a more general point, um, which I think is really important that we always keep in view. Um, so first, there is of course a legal definition. There is of course a, and, and, and in legal matters, we all, as we all know, the Supreme Court has the ultimate authority and in interpretation of, of the fundamental law. And of course the Supreme Court changes its mind um, and, and overturns itself and puts itself back. And that, the fact that the highest tribunal, the body with not only the ultimate authority, but also with the most information, the most, training the most uh the most informed changes its mind um it tells us something right and, and and what it tells us is this general principle which is that in this democratic culture that we live it's a culture of democratic debate is a culture of the struggle of ideas is a culture where each one of each one of us as part of our civic life as part of our civic um identity are engaged in a battle, in a discursive, in a, um, uh, exp in a battle of ideas about these kinds of questions, about what the fundamental norms, rules, and laws are and what the ones that are mean, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a call for us to be politically engaged. It's a call for us to be out there in the field of ideas and debate, uh, arguing and um, advancing what we believe to be the highest ideal of our collective pursuit for justice, right? We are collectively committed to ideas of justice and fairness. Um, so what does that commitment demand of me, right? So um, I, I say to this question, and I say, as I say to my students, we need to be out there in the civic space, um, engaged and um, advancing the conversation to, towards a greater and greater embodiment of fundamental ideas that we really very, very broadly share. We really, really very broadly share um, the fundamental uh, ideals of a nation and a community. Mm -hmm. I love a good call to action. Thanks, Roosevelt. <laughs> well, and so uh, there are a few different directions I want us to go, but we only have a few minutes left. So I'm going to try to do a weird gymnastics move in which <laughs> I pull together a few of them, which is which are so you know when when we think about this question of free speech and civility, and we think about the tyranny of the majority in the context of a democracy, um, what I'm wondering about, and I'm, I'm seeing come up in a few of the questions and the comments in the chat is the founders themselves, when they were 
drafting, crafting, debating, ratifying the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. You know, they were obsessed with the question of the tyranny of the majority, hence the Electoral College, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, so how does that manifest in this question of freedoms and rights in, in the founding era? And then yeah. here's my gymnastics move. <laughs> how, how do we, as a society that does fundamentally agree on the importance and the power of these rights. And as you said at the very beginning, in, in, in a meaningful way, that is what defines us as Americans. But we also somehow have sort of lost the, the space for civil discourse that you're, you're working to rebuild in your classroom. How do, how, how do we do that in classrooms across America? How do we do that outside of classrooms when yeah. we are living in a time in which a lot of families just say politics aren't, evol aren't allowed at the dinner table because inevitably somebody will storm out and slam the door. That has happened in my own family. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, a winding road of a question, but yeah. you know these big, these big fundamental paradoxes yeah. specifically to do with rights and freedoms, where did the founders land? How did they exercise that civil discourse? Yeah. To get to the point of ratifying yeah. the Bill of Rights and then whoa, how yeah. to resurrect it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So small questions, you know. Uh, that that that's and you know, as 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 with previous ones, I I don't have answers but reflections. I've I I have I have some thoughts on uh, on this. Um one is the founders were um <laughs> um Oh gosh, I have to, uh, let me preface the preface by saying <laughs> that this 18th century, there is there is there is a, it's a there's a cultural moment that has to do with the pervasiveness of um, a kind of humanistic education in the United States. The fact that so many of the founders were lawyers, the fact that so many of them had a grounding in philosophical, historical. Um, ethical reasoning, largely through reading the the classics, um, in the in, in the wake of what of, of kind of in the grip of the Enlightenment, in the grip of the ascendance of faith in our capacity to reason and to figure out nature and to and to and our fascination with the laws of nature and the fact that nature functions in an orderly and predictable mm -hmm. regular way. So there's a kind of cultural configuration that produces a moment in which an architecture as intricate and as um, specific as the constitution and the accompanying uh, debates around the constitution, other documents like the Declaration of Independence and the Federalist Papers, et cetera. So there's a moment in which this, in which this happens, which um, yeah, I think is cultural and historically unique. Um, and so that's just, that's the preface to the preface. Um, the the preface is that the founding fathers were deadlocked on really important and big issues, intractable issues, issues that they could not solve, issues that they could not speak to each other about, issue, issues on which they hated each other, and which just 70, 80 years later would lead to a bloody civil war. Um, and the biggest of those issues is slavery. Cannot solve that problem. Um, you have abolitionists at the Constitutional Convention. You have slaveholders at the Constitutional Convention. Um, you have people who believe in the equality of all men, like Thomas Jefferson, who at the same time denies those rights um, by force to, um, to a whole group of people. Um, so the founding fathers um, were in polarizations that were in some ways, even more severe, more um, demanding, more dangerous and irreconcilable than ones that we find ourselves today in. And they did not reconcile. They could not reconcile them. They did go to um, the ultimate breakdown of their the democratic project that they tried to launch. All, you know, there's a way in which it sank. The boat sank. Um, and yes, thank God, it was repaired and launched again uh, with, with new and better paneling or something. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, 
should not, even though I think in, 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 our, in, in our living memory, I think this is maybe the most polarized moment, but it's not the most polarized moment. There have been moments uh, in, in American history, there have been moments of uh, even greater polarization, you know, and, and violence, like, you know, think of the 60s, think of the political assassinations, think of the, the bombings, you know, ter domestic terrorists were bombing um, the, the government offices, um, and, and, of course, and, and the president is assassinated, civil rights leaders are, are being assassinated, they're rise in the streets. There's, there's, so to put our moment in perspective, but about our moment, we are in a historically unprecedented moment. And, and one way to think about it is that the rise of social media, digital information, um, put in front of us discursive challenges discursive complexities that we as a society were not, have not been able to metabolize, have not been, have been overwhelmed by that. That is, we, it's like the internet put us through a historical test, through a test of our discursive strength, and we failed, and we're failing that test. Now, I have hope that we are learning. You know, we're learning about what social media does to political discourse. We're learning about what it does to the minds of people, what it does to young people, what it does to teenagers. And it's like we, we were given a toy, a tool that we just have not known how to use. I have faith that we'll figure it out, but that's, you know, I'm just, I'm just an optimist. Um, but, you know, take, you know, take the, 20, the 2016 election where there is a, a Russian campaign of misinformation to impact the presidential outcome. Now, the presidential election, as you all know, in 2016 and in 2020 were decided by, by wafer thin margins, you know, tens of thousands of votes, you know, 9,000 votes in, in, in Pennsylvania, 12,000 votes in Michigan, 17,000 votes in Wisconsin, et cetera. And the, the, the misinformation campaign, um, it's like we were hacked. We were discursively hacked. We as a society uh, do, do not have a capacity to distinguish conspiracy from truth, science from um, propaganda, ideology from rationale. We do not have a sufficiently sophisticated set of discursive tools to navigate our current environment. Again, I am hopeful that we're getting better, but we are really in uncharted territory. And um, again, our job, as well, you know, not all, I know there are some of you are educators, some of you are in the field of, of, of education, like any museum is or, or Center for Civic Education, right? We are in, 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 a, um, in a field where our job is to precisely strengthen the discursive sophistication and the discursive capacity of the American public to metabolize, disseminate, parse the flood of information um, and um, media that surrounds us. That was a mouth, three mouth, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, um, I think actually that's a, a great place to end, A, because optimism is important, but as is realism, <laughs> we have to move forward with our eyes open. Um, and also it's 8.30, so we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt, thank you so much. Um, thank you, man. It's a pleasure. An honor, as always. We will circulate information to everybody about your forthcoming book, which I'm very, very Thank you very much. Um, and with that, in our last 30 seconds, Emily uh, from Montpelier is going to preview what we'll be up to next week. Yes, thank you, Mia, and thank you, Roosevelt. So next week, we are going back to the first portion of the First Amendment. We are getting into freedom of religion, so free exercise, um, and then establishment. So our guest speaker next week will be uh, Vincent Philip Munoz from the University of Notre Dame, um, who has written very extensively, uh, both in historical context, with a book called God and the Founders, um, up to a more, uh, a more broad reading of how those religion clauses have worked their way into so many different Supreme Court cases. Um, so we're looking forward to another great discussion. And just as a quick reminder, if you have not signed up for that separately, 
Um, each of the six weeks of this session of this series will require a separate registration. So please make sure you're signed up for next week and we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you all very much. We'll see ya.